moi confié euh, l'honneur de vous présenter euh, Jacob Poshinger, donc qui a rejoint l'IRT Systemics depuis peu, euh, qui est également professeur à Centrale Supélec et, et titulaire euh, de la chaire Anthropolis entre Systemix et l'IRT Systemix et euh, Centrale Supélec. Euh, donc avant de rejoindre l'IRT euh, Systemix, euh, Jacob a une euh, longue expérience derrière lui. Donc il a commencé euh, à l'université de Melbourne, donc avant de rejoindre euh, l'Institut technologique d'Autriche, où il a officié en tant que chercheur dans le domaine de l'optimisation et la logistique des transports. Euh, et où il a pris également euh, la tête d'un groupe de, de recherche sur cette thématique. Euh, et donc Jacob va nous présenter aujourd'hui euh, les problèmes et euh, les challenges qui se posent dans l'intégration des véhicules électriques dans les environnements actuels. Donc je passe la main à Jacob. Um, I think I will not need a mic, thanks. Um, so I will make my presentation in English uh, today, since especially with all the specific technical wording, I'm, I'm much more convenient in, in English. Um, so my talk is about uh, challenges with, with electric vehicles, um, uh, using them in, in, the, in fleets, introducing them in, in existing fleets, Um, yeah, so this will be my seminar talk today. So first of all, I want to thank my co-authors from the Austrian Institute of Technology, from the University of Vienna, and also from the PUC Rio, who, whom I'm all very grateful to have co-authored all this, this work with me. And without them, I couldn't have, we couldn't have done this than, than by working together. Also, most of this work was done during my time at the Austrian Institute of, of Technology. Um, and it was done within mainly three um, projects. One about electric taxis in Vienna, one about um, strategic fleet management, and one about operational fleet management, both funded by Austrian funding agencies. So what is the, the motivation to, to use uh, electric mobility in an urban context. So first of all, and I think that's the one of the main benefits of electric mobility is that we do not have any local emissions. So, so especially in cities who, who have problems with smog, um, I think Paris is one of those cities we also see now currently in, in Beijing, the red alert level for smog. Um, so For these problems, electric vehicles would be one, one way of solving it. On the other hand, they are not completely emission-free because we don't know where the electricity comes from that is, is, is powering them. So um, in countries like Austria, it would come a lot of renewable energy sources. Um, in France, there would be a lot of nuclear energy. So this would be emission-free. But in other countries um, where electricity is mostly uh, coming from coal or, or gas, um, they are clearly not emission free. So there is lots of discussion about um, the global CO2 um, benefits of electric vehicles. But, but in terms of local emissions, the advantages are, are very clear. And why, why are they getting more interesting? So now. Nowadays, electric vehicles have an increased range. So today, it's most of the vehicles are able to, 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 to have an, uh, a range of, of 150 kilometers. Um, but, and then there is one special um, uh, uh, Tesla who, is, who has vehicles with a range of up to 400 kilometers. And they are getting more and more cost, cost efficient, especially they have very low Uh, cost for maintenance in comparison to, to conventional vehicles. However, they are usually 
more costly than conventional vehicles, the range is still limited, and the recharging operation is much more time consuming than, than refueling a standard car. Um, if you have a fast charging infrastructure, you can recharge about 80% in, in half an hour uh, as a rule of thumb. But, but normally you need like six hours to fully recharge your car with, with medium speed uh, recharging. So this is, I think, the main challenge for using, for, for a broad use of electric vehicles in cities is the limited range and the long recharging times. So, so if we want to introduce electric vehicles in different contexts, so here you have a taxi, here you have individual vehicles, and here you might even have uh, freight vehicles, um, you need to take some strategic decisions on the one hand, where to locate recharging stations so that you can integrate them in your operations as well as possible, and then how to you configure your fleet on the long term. So how many vehicles will you buy or not, or sell? And then there is the operational decision, which are on a daily basis, um, where you have to take decisions on, on vehicle allocation and tour planning. So as a first uh, topic, I want to talk about strategic planning. Um, so, so here we, in uh, this uh, part, we developed uh, a decision support system for placing fast charging station for electric taxi cabs. So this is in the context of a project in the city of Vienna, where the, the main electricity provider, um, comparable maybe to no, it's not. It's it's Vienna Electricity actually. Um, they they want to to encourage taxi owners to buy electric taxi cabs and to build up a fleet um, of up to 200 electric taxi cabs by 2017. Um, and that's why they they want to provide them some recharging infrastructure at some well uh, placed locations. Um, so, so that's the idea to, to put them on, on locations where, where we have good coverage of the whole area of the city and a high demand of taxi services so that taxi uh, drivers or taxi owners uh, can, can be quite confident that they will have a new customer um, without wait too, too, long, too much of a waiting time. Um, and so there is a main trade-off between the budget and coverage of the charging demand and the road network, which is mainly expressed by the number of recharging stations that are, that are put in place. Um, so what, what did we do? Um, we took uh, the GPS data from 800 taxis over one whole year um, and made some first analysis of this data to, to look at what, what ha what hap what's happening in the city. And of course, this is what you would expect, is that you have a qu very high demand in the inner city district and then lower demands in the outer, outer parts of the city. And then you might have some hot spots like uh, the airport or, or other parts of the city here. Here there is the main Uno, there is the Uno city, so, so there is some, some areas where you have more, um, more taxi demand again. Um, and so what, 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 is the, what our goal is, is to locate, to find good locations for these fast charging range, uh, stations in region with very high density and high overall coverage. So, so the what do we need to do? We need to select regions for locating fast charging stations. So because when you place these fast charging stations somewhere in the city, you can imagine uh, the perfect location, but then will, there will be a politician who will be saying, no, this location is impossible because there, um, uh, there is for some reason you cannot put it there and then you find the next location then there will be the owner who will say no you are not allowed to put it there and so on so so it's really not feasible to 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 plan for on precise location but we 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 decided to plan for regions where we uh, recommend the placement of a charging stations and then it, it's the actually the 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 electricity provider is is um 
starting some negotiations with the landowners, with the uh, politicians, and so on, to, to decide about the exact location of the, of the charging stations. So what, what we did is to sum up the demand in, in hexagons with a certain diameter that is not too large to, to, to be able to, to, to reduce this to, to regions of high density. Um, so you can see here, I don't know if you can see it on the screen, but, but here you have this hexagonal um, grid of, of demand. Um, so what we did is we, we, we developed a very a quite simple um, mixed integer programming model to maximize the number of covered trip with a fixed number of recharging stations that need to be placed. We can also include some existing infrastructure into the model. So at the time wh where we were looking at this problem, there were already two or three existing fast charging stations. So we had to take them into the account in order to compute the correct coverage of the city. So that's possible as well. And also in order to be able to parameterize this, the spreading of the coverage, um, we weighted the hexagons that are neighboring hexagons of each hexagons into the coverage. And so we got um, different solutions depending on these weights that are more compact or more spread out. Um, so that was the idea of this model. Um, it, it's actually a quite simple model and especially since the we are only talking about 10 or 20 charging stations, it can be solved very quickly using standard um, mixed integer programming solvers. So here you can see some, some solution. So on this side you see a solution with a lower weighting factor, meaning this creates a denser solution with 10 recharging stations. So the stars are the existing recharging stations and these are the new one. Um, and here you can uh, less, a more spread out solution which emphasizes a more the geographical coverage where we weighted the, the neighboring hexagons with a weight factor of one. So this is just an example. Um, and then what we did in order to, to um, convey what, what a solution means for a decision maker, we also computed isochrones. So the, the yellow ones are reachable within five minutes and the orange ones are reachable within eight minutes. So that means how far each road segment is away from the next uh, recharging station. So, so here you can see again in this solution where it's more spread out, we have more coverage. Of course, the center is less yellow covered, but still actually this solution seems to be more interesting um, for the overall coverage. Um, and then we looked at even more detail on, on what, what it means. So we looked at different number of, of um, fast charging stations. We looked at, since we are talking about hexagons, we looked at the minimal and the maximal time from within to, to each position in this hexagon. So, so because we, we were thinking of, of criticism because if you are placing the charging station in one corner of the hexagon, you still have to traverse the hexagon to get there. So that's why you get two numbers here in terms of percentage. Always if you, when you are taking the minimal or maximum distance within the hexagon. And what we see is that with, um, with a very large number, 30 um, charging stations, we can cover almost the whole network of Vienna and, and they, we chose or the, they had the budget for placing 10 charging stations. So at least they can cover within eight minutes about um, yeah, 43 percent of the network, which actually is sufficient because the, the taxis are mainly located in the, in the inner city area. So, so it's 10, 10 resizing stations seems to be quite decent for a first uh, approach. Um, yeah, so this was uh, our, say, decision-making tool for, for placing charging stations. Um, and and they, they started already building them and the project has already started now. So they, they have now about 60 taxi cabs in Vienna already operating electric. And the goal is to get to about 300. 
and 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 I mean there is some they get some fundings the taxi owners to to get this started this process, but but still they they take some uh, economic risk also in in doing this because they since their taxi cabs cabs need to stay for say half an hour at some point, they they are of course potentially losing customers. Yeah? And also they cannot do very long trips. They can go to the airport, but they cannot go, for example, to, to some other city, 200 kilometers. I mean, there is not often such trips, but sometimes there are such trips and, and they can make a lot of money with, with such trips. But it seems to be they are quite positive. Um, so, so actually the, the taxi cab organization wa was also part of the project, so we, they really were able to, to give us all the, the problems they had or the, 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 the things they could uh, think of that would, would be uh, not so advantageous for the taxi drivers. Okay, so the next uh, topic is about uh, now the really the introduction of of, of vehicles into a into a fleet. So how how many and which composition of a fleet do I want to achieve to get some cost balance and emissions balance? So so what what we looked here was long term strategic decision regarding um, fleet composition, um, the consideration of vehicle pools. So so we considered that a a company um, has a pool of vehicles and, and the, 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 the workers in this company can then use those vehicles for some whatever purpose, that the daily mobility needs of all the employees are secured. And then there is also an incorporation of modal alternatives. So some companies will say, okay, for some trip types, you will have to use the train or the public transport, um, or some even might, might encourage bicycle use for, for shorter distances. Um, so we can include those modes with a certain percentage into this fleet planning. Um, and the goal is to have a decision-making tool um, to support a fleet manager in the strategic planning, so s when he makes his budget or plans his purchasing and selling um, of the cars, um, to, to make his decision which cars to buy and to sell. Um, and the idea is, or, or what is the main challenge then, is, is that he or she, the fleet manager, has to make some assumptions, on the one hand, about the development of the mobility need within the company or or within the fleet, so we will have mm, like 10% increase in, in long distance trips or whatever. And also they need to make some assumptions about vehicle characteristics, okay, so battery uh, capacity will double within the next five years, or, or we will get many more recharging stations or much better recharging infrastructure, so it will be much easier to be recharging at customer locations or at wherever meetings happen or wherever they, they have to go, for example. So this can be included and then a fleet manager can, ha can make like optimistic or pessimistic scenarios in terms of um, um, electric vehicle possibilities in order to, to plan his fleet uh, long-term fleet composition. And what we also did um, here is that, that our the objective value of this uh, method is, is a bi-objective uh, problem. So on the one hand we are minimizing cost and on the other hand we are minimizing CO2 emissions. So, so the data we used here was Austrian um, um, emissions data average um, for, for electricity. Um, but of course you could use uh, every other data in every other country. So, so in Austria really using electric vehicles is beneficial in terms of, of CO2 emissions and that's why, why it makes sense. But in other countries it, may, it make, may not make sense or may not make such so much sense. So um, what, what do we have? So we have some existing vehicles in the fleet, of course Many companies will already have some vehicle pool and then there might be some range of vehicles that can be acquired this year, next year, in two years, whatever. And then 
b you can make assumptions about how the vehicle will look like in three, four years, whatever. And then there is some costs about how much they cost when you acquire them, when you uh, sell them. You have some mainten maintenance cost and you might also have some additional fiscal advantages or whatever that you can include in the system um, in order to, to, to have a realistic cost estimate. And then you have some information on the mobility demand. So what we have is we, we use representative daily trips per time period. So we, 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 we um, um, uh, represent the problem in time period. So in, in the first uh, year it's, it's on a monthly basis and then on a quarterly basis. Um, and then we have some cost and emissions um, associated to each trip depending on the vehicle type. Um, and then we can also use rented vehicles um, to compensate for high demand uh, periods and there also we have some cost and emissions. Um, and also we have to include these alternative modes of transport. So what is the idea of the, the method we use? So we modeled this problem as a two-stage um, stochastic uh, programming model where in the first stage decisions we minimize uh, time-dependent cost and the expected distance-dependent cost and also the expected um, emissions. And in the second uh, stage, in the sub-stage, um, we, we, on those multiple representative single-day scenarios per time period, we minimize the distance-dependent costs and the emissions. And so using Using these uh, solutions of these uh, sub-problems on each scenario, we can then, in the, in the um, top uh, layer, in the first stage, um, compute the expected uh, cost. So that's the idea. Um, and as I said before, it's a multi-objective or bi-objective problem. So the idea is that we have, in our uh, optimization approach, we have an iterative method starting from the initial fleet and then we take buying and selling decisions for each of the scenarios, of course. Um, and um, wha what we do is then if we find some cost and emission, some solution that has lower cost and emission than previous solutions, they are, these are called dominating solutions and they are then used as, as new solution in our optimization approach and this is how iteratively we improve we compute this Pareto front of solutions. Um, so as a first example, I, I want to show you we had in the project, we actually had some charging pl station placement on the corridor of Vienna to Graz. And here we took an example because uh, another part of this project was the development of a plug-in hybrid vehicle. So we took an example where really we can see the the effects of this plug-in hybrid vehicle. So we, we took, here you can see um, a, a starting um, fleet composition with seven vehicles. Um, and then you have here this Pareto front that is computed. Um, and here you have one solution that has uh, very low emissions and high costs. It has four, so during this the time period we look at, we buy four battery electric vehicles and four plug-in hybrids. And then there is a second solution here, which has um, then a higher emissions and lower cost, um, where we buy less um, electric vehicles uh, and use more conventional vehicles. And that's why we have uh, higher emission rates, of course. And so, so this is then when a decision maker can say, okay, here is my budget and then so but this is actually interesting so so here you can with a with quite a similar budget you can can i mean it's not uh, with, with quite a big difference in budget you can get a very similar um, uh, type of emissions so so here it's it's worth if you are considering budget um, considerations it, it's worth it's worth choosing these solutions because you get quite a good trade-off between uh, emissions and, and budgets, for example. So this is just an example. Um, but, but this is the type of method we developed um, for the strategic uh, planning. 
And then in a, in a third uh, project or in third type of work, we looked at the operational planning, also on the vehicle assignment, so which vehicles to use for which uh, routes or tours and for which and what, what type of tours we should do in, in e for each vehicle. So this is really a classical operational vehicle routing problem where we assume we have three vehicle classes, the classical um, motorized vehicles, then battery electric vehicles and plug-in vehicles. Um, in our problem we are given a depot and some customers and then we have also recharging stations. So these are these uh, triangles. Um, and of course we have different costs for using um, energy or fossil fuel and it's, it's, you can, so the customers have all to be served within some time windows and it's, and regarding the, the recharging stations they are optional so even several vehicles can, can go to each recharging station or they can be used or not um, and this, this um, optionality makes the modeling of this problem quite tricky um, and, and that's one of the interesting aspects from a modeling and optimization point of view. So what this actually the problem we are looking at is composed of three different types of problems. So one is the classical um, vehicle routing problem with time windows. So this is a very well known problem in the literature. Then there is the, the electric vehicle routing problem with time windows and partial recharging. So this is purely electric vehicles that have, have to drive to some customers and then they, they are recharging, maybe not fully recharging but only up to a certain percentage because they don't need a full recharge to serve the last customer and return to the depot. Um, so this is um, re already a, a newer and e quite interesting problem and then there is a third problem which is the problem where we have plug-in electric vehicles where they are not only recharging but you can choose on each um, partial route if it is using electric or, or fuel energy. So for example here um, there is no more electricity or not enough electricity so he uses fuel to get to the next recharging station, recharges there then he can use uh, electricity again but here um, for example, there is also not enough electricity, so he has 0.7% of the partial route is done electric and the other part is done uh, with fuel. So we have really these three decision layers for these three different vehicle <coughs> types. Um, so the first layer is the itinerary, um, which is more or less the same decision layer for all three problem types. And then we have, um, this is the top top layer. And then we have the, the recharging station visits which is um, a second decision that we have to take um, and then we have to decide how much we charge in each recharging station and then we decide also um, what mode we use for the, for the plug-in vehicle. So, so the idea is now to that we have here already in the first layer we have decided on, a, on itinerary and then we have some recharging stations on the somewhere and then the idea is that implicitly we can with this given itinerary compute the best possible placement of the recharging station using a dynamic programming algorithm so here we just um, have to solve a shortest path problem that that, that has different subpaths and here we choose the one with the best uh, um, value that is then that's meaning we, we use um, recharging station 10 after node 2. So we are going here, here, so you can here see the solution. And then for the second part, you can see that we are recharging in, in, in recharging station 12. So that's the idea that we have each solution. So a, a solution on the top layer looks like this. And then in the evaluation phase of the algorithm or in the um, optimization phase, we can compute for this itinerary the optimal placement of, of recharging station using a um, shortest path, more or less shortest path or labeling kind of algorithm. Um, so that's, that's the main idea of, of this thing which is more or less one innovative part in the algorithm and now I show you the, 
how we solve this problem. So we use a, a heuristic solver. So it's, it's mainly a, a population-based meta-heuristic. So, so actually it's a, a genetic algorithm. So each chromosome in this genetic algorithm is rep representing a giant tour. So it's just a giant tour is just this, it's just the, it's just the nodes in the order they are used. So it's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And then the automatically we determine which, which are the sub-tours and then it's determined which, which charging stations are used. Um, so we use um, binary tournament selection um, to select each individual for, 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 for using in the next generation and we penalize um, load capacity and time windows. And this is the overall scheme of the, of the solver. So we have some population and then we have the different parts of this uh, genetic algorithm which is crossover. Then we have some local a large neighborhood search, then we have some set partitioning, um, and then we ab have also a local search component. So, so the, the crossover, we use a um, quite standard thing, so we use the binary tournament selection, we use an ordered crossover on the giant tours, and then we use the split procedure for decoding, and it's exactly this split procedure that, that, that makes out of this giant tour several subtours for each vehicle. Um, in the large neighborhood search we have, says we have some set of destroy and, and repair operators that are also quite, I would say, standard, um, where we create new uh, solutions um, in terms of which is a kind of a local search. Um, in the next part, and this is quite interesting, this, this set partitioning part, um, we, we store promising complete tools and then we put them into a kind of a storage and then we, we apply a set partitioning um, model to it and then this combi combines various um, partial tools or uh, various um, tools from other from different solutions together in a best possible way. So, so the idea is that if we have um, one, one thing like this from one solution and one thing like that from another solution, that we combine them between, it's like a linear combination of different sub-solutions. Yeah? And, and that's the nice thing about the set partitioning approach that without having to, to do something new, it can compute the best possible linear combination of solutions we have already encountered during the search. So this is a component that, that helps a lot um, in improving um, a solution quality, overall solution quality. Um, and then we have a, a local search uh, uh, part where we, we use also quite standard um, local search operators, but we use it also as a repair step so if we see that we, are, we do not meet the time window constraints or the load constraints, we can increase the penalties and reapply the local search to, to get to, um, to feasible solutions. So that was now a quite technical um, part on, on how we solve these kind of operational problems. And now I show you some, some results. So here, with the standard problems, um, which is just... Um, I would say um, you get some obvious results, right? So, so of course, if, if the fuel price increases, you will use more electrical vehicles um, and a lower fixed cost for the, for the, for the um, conventional vehicles is the major advantage. So since they are much cheaper, you will maybe buy more of those or use more of those because in this this uh, problem type, we, we, we included the acquisition price into the daily or into the kilometer cost actually. So, so what you can see here is that here you can see the fuel cost. Um, so we, we looked at increasing fuel cost and then the usage of the ty different vehicle types. So you can see the, the here this is the total cost um, of the fleet, so it, it increases. And then you can see when, as long as you have low fuel cost, you will use a lot of conventional vehicles. And then 
as, as more expensive the fuel gets, you will use more battery electric vehicles and also more plug-in vehicles. And, and then there is some point where, where you then use again less plug-in hybrids because the it's even better to use electrical, but you will still need some plug-in vehicles because you might have some distances that are too long for the battery range. So you will, that's why you need some, some conventional vehicles. So that, that's more or less the learning out of this standard problem. But now we, we thought of, okay, many, many cities now, they, they start uh, thinking about city center restrictions or some, like London, they have this uh, the, um, uh, city center charging or, or some other cities, Milan or whatever, um, um, Stockholm, Singapore. So, so we, we now thought about having a daily fee or a kilometer-based fee for entering the city center um, depending on, on the type of car you are using. So when you are using an electric car, um, you can enter for free or with a lower cost and with a conventional car, you will have to pay more to enter the city and then we looked at what kind of consequences this type of restrictions could have on fleet composition and usage of, of vehicles. So what is a city center? It's an area in the city that is some limited and there is some fixed entry points. So you can imagine the, the roads entering the city are those entry points. And then we this city center partitions the city in an in inside part. So these are this the green uh, customers and the outside part, which are the, the other customers. And then so each path can be either outside the center, it can be inside the center, or it can also cross uh, the center. And also since we are dealing with a road network, we do not have any Euclidean distances, but, but real street network uh, distances. Um, so what, what did we look at? What kind of restrictions or what restrictions are possible? Okay, you can have some time restrictions. So entering the city center is only possible at a certain point in time. Um, or you can have engine-based restrictions, so no conventional vehicles are allowed at all. Um, you can only allow, for example, very small vehicles. Um, or you can penalize um, entering, depending on vehicle type, you can have a one-time fee or you can have a kilometer cost. And so these, that's what we looked at. We looked at complete engine restrictions and then penalization. Um, and now, so this, this type of problem, when we look at the algorithm or the, the, the model of the problem we had before, um, we get an additional decision layer, which is um, um, how how do we get to this node? So we can, so for example, imagine you can, okay, you can here, you can go like this, but if you want to go here, you can go through the city center and here, or you can go around, right? Bo both is possible, and, and that's, that's where you have to take a, a another type of decision, because each leg can be, can consist of at three, or even more, depending if you have several, you can also imagine several, regions that are somehow restricted. Um, so this gives us a new, um, new decision problem. So we have to travel between inside and outside nodes. Um, also we can, that, that's what I described here, but we can also only travel inside or we can travel around. So these are the var various possibilities. So what did we look at? We had some experiments using the street graph of the city of Vienna. We have some random locations for customers, we have some locations for depots. Um, here we defined entry points based on the, on the one ways in the, in the inner city area. Um, and then we also have a eight hour planning horizon. We have some random demand for each customer, some time windows, and we have some optimistic assumptions regarding the, the charging technology. Um, and so what you can see here, and this is a kind of a typical solution when you have a small city center, is that you will um, use a lot of conventional vehicles that are only driving outside, and then you have one or two electrical vehicles that are doing all the customers inside. And because they are cheaper, or that in if they are doing more kilometers, they are getting cheaper, they are also driving a lot outside the city center. But, but this 
such a solution you get when you, you restrict the inner city very strongly, at least for the Vienna case. Um, and when you're only looking at a small city center. So we are now investigating different, very different other shapes of, of city centers. So you could also look at, at a, like a little bit the outer ring where you restrict the, the city center and this would give you much, maybe more use of electric vehicles. <coughs> so here you can see the different types of restrictions. So we have no restriction at all. Then we only use um, conventional vehicles. Then we have here complete um, conventional um, motorized, uh, so fuel-driven uh, vehicles in the inner city. So then we use um, battery electric vehicles inside and also outside. And outside is also a lot of, of conventional ones and then you have different fees so here you have daily fees that are going from two units to ten units and only with ten units you get some some usage of, of electric vehicles and also we have kilometer based fees going up to two per kilometer and here also you you get a use of of electric vehicles um, then if we look at another um, um, description of our results you can see um, depending on the again on the type of restriction um, you can see that mostly vehicles are used outside um, the city center because most kilo because the city center is only small most kilometers mm -hmm. are made outside um, and also battery electric vehicles are really only strongly used when you have a full restriction or a very high kilometer based fee um, so what we then do did is also we looked at kind of artificial data that is, is, is based on some uh, um, in benchmark instances. I don't go into the details how we made them, but we used also some, some um, other studies to get some realistic information about fleet data and, and prices and capacities and, and also um, electricity, battery size and so on. Um, and what we see here um, is that we get much more use of electric vehicles independent of the restrictions. Um, of course, it's getting higher if we restrict more, but still you get, we get much more use. Um, so, and you can see this in this other, the same picture here as well. And so the, the thing is that why do we get this big difference? So these artificial instances were originally designed for, for the vehicle routing problem with time windows and recharging. Um, and, and it was really designed so from the distances it's good for electric vehicles. And it was also um, designed with very mm, good recharging rates. Um, and the other thing is that the, the city center we chose for Vienna is, is very small, so it has no impact on the outer parts. And if, if, if the, so if we would consider like in Paris, say the whole, everything that is inside the peripherique, this would be a way other picture. Um, um, so this is something we look at for um, currently, um, it's, it's a PhD student, Gerhard, Hierman, who is looking at, at this, um, looking at different shapes of cities and so on. But we do not have the results yet. But, but so, so this, this thing is, is quite interesting then for city planners or decision makers on what consequences their decisions on city center restrictions could have on vehicle usage. Because when, when I, as, as we can see on this, this picture here, right? Um, even if I only restrict this small part of the city, I, I still have some electric vehicles that need to go outside this restricted part. So, so, so things like this can then help decision makers to say, okay, wh what, what kind of political decision will we take for our city and what consequences this could have. Um, yeah, so, so that was... Um, part of, of our, um, the work we did in Vienna on electric vehicles. So as I said, still the main challenge is range and recharging. Um, and there is really two types of decision we have to take 
or which are challenges with electric vehicles. These are the strategic decisions for the fleet mix. And if I own them or if I have them in my fleet, then there's the decision, um, how do I use them? And this is just a reminder um, on my colleagues. Um, okay, so I'm happy if you have any questions. And I hope I will be able to answer them. Uh, is there an, any question in the audience? I, mean, I have a question concerning the infrastructure you need uh, to to recharge uh, the uh, the cars. So um, you need to deploy. I mean, especially for fast charging, uh, you have to. You need to deploy a big amount of energy in a short time. So uh, when you were dealing with the uh, electricity supplier of the of the city. Uh, could he deliver this amount of energy without modifying the infrastructure, or he need to, or it need to do? Or it was some uh, improvements in the infrastructure were necessary to to be able to deliver enough enough power. So, as far as I know, it was not so. It's not so many char um, fast charging stations that they need really to to do a lot of changes in the grid. Um, only local improvements, I think. Um, and, and we did in a previous project to the V-Taxi project, we did the project together with the Technical University of Vienna um, with some specialists working on smart grids and, and grids, grid uh, changes. And they also saw that uh, the, for the taxi cabs, the grid, the existing grid would be sufficient. So no, no changes. And of course, if you, if you then think about many more vehicles, that's, that's different. But if you, if you look at the problem only with, say, 200 taxi cabs or something like this, then it's not a, a problem for the grid. OK, so in, in, your, opti uh, in your optimization, you didn't take account? We did not take into account the grid, because it was not, uh, it was not necessary in this, with this size. I mean, of course, if you don't place 10 but 100 recharging stations, then it's a different story, I think. Any other question? Uh, I have one. Um, I would like to know to what extent uh, you have taken into account uh, real life constraints, like uh, topological aspects of the, the roads or um, usage rates uh, of the roads, and so on, and if you plan to, to do in the future. So, um, OK, there is different things. Yeah? So, so we have, in the, in the long-term planning, um, of course, we take into account real-time um, data from the fleets, so about the fuel use. Uh, these are average values. Um, if, if we use the operational thing, currently we do not take really real data into account yet, or here in this case. Um, but we've been working on, on other methods and problem settings where we did. So where we, for example, we did some routing for ambulances, and there we took into account um, um, changing travel times over the day. So since, since you have like peak hour, so you have usually two peaks or, or whatever in, in your, your and there we used um, travel time data, detailed travel time data, and we have like 15 minutes intervals um, where we have really fine-grained um, um, travel time data we used in, in our methods. And we also have shortest path algorithms that use these um, time-dependent travel times to, to compute shortest path depending on the time of the day. So we, we have bits and pieces, but in this work we didn't use it at, at AIT. Yeah. Okay, because sometimes the shortest path is not the, the path that requires uh, the least energy. We also, so yes, but this is also something, yeah, I mean, we, we had developed fastest, shortest, and least energy path 
um, algorithms. We combine them because least energy is usually not very good because we, we take into account the whole topology and you have to take into account speed. So often then you will be going through 30k zones where you shouldn't really, a lot of vehicles should go through to these zones. So it's just uh, um, residential areas and whatever. So we still combine usually when, when we did this combined um, fastest and energy efficient path together to get some fast and quite efficient um, path. And, uh, one more question. Uh, what about the human behavior and your models? Um, that's a good question. In the, so not here in this work, but in the work where we did the energy efficient um, fastest or shortest path uh, algorithms we had, we took into account uh, user behavior in terms of a percentage. So we had users that are, we had a variability in, in usage of about 20% percent in energy usage or 30%. So depending on what type of user it is, it just uh, uses more or less energy. But it, this was just a very, I would say, simple way of, of modeling user behavior. But, but, but of course, especially in, and also in electric vehicles, users have a behavior related to using, um, uh, how do you call this? Um, like if you use climatization or if you use music and so on in your car, this also takes some energy. So some people are, are driving with very loud music and with 25 degrees, then they will be using lots more of energy than a user who, who only uses 21 degrees and no music, for example. Yeah? So, so, so the, we took this into account as well. Yeah? But, but yeah, it, it, it's clearly not. And it's also depending on the every day will be different. M maybe um, on one day you are just relaxed and you will be driving very relaxed and on the next day you will be stressed and then you will be have a completely different driving behavior and, and use much more energy when, when driving. So, the same user can have a very different behavior. So it's, I think in, in predictive methods or in planning, it's, mm, it's not so easy to include this. But, but uh, I mean, yeah, you see in, in when, you, when they do, we had uh, other projects where we worked together with people who did, um, um, uh, like how do you call this, courses for drivers. And they clearly had huge differences in fuel use, um, especially, for example, with truck drivers, um, depending on, on how they how they are driving, so it's it's okay, it's you. something you have to take into account. Um, EDF is currently buying a lot of electric vehicles and is facing this kind of problems. Uh, such as uh, how to best determine day ahead the way to uh, allocate EV or um, hybrid vehicles to works and uh, also to manage a fleet uh, over a full year. I mean, sometimes there are seasonal parameters and uh, a fleet well adapted for summer would be useless in winter or some vehicles would be better used in warmer areas. Um, are some of your uh, tools, algorithms, or methods adapted to solve this kind of problems? Because for instance, in companies like uh, EDF, but other companies with fleet, uh, works is known for Foundered. We have all the determinated data on uh, the places to go, and the only things to do is just to solve this kind of uh, allocation problem yeah I think it's the it's the vehicle allocation and and what we did here in in the third problem we we did vehicle allocation and tour planning so and if you have tour planning you can only I mean I, I'm sure you can adapt the methods we developed here to such problems I'm quite confident I mean maybe not directly but with some adaptations
So at least uh, if you know some problems, um, we should have a chat. Uh, first, thanks for your presentation. Um, if I understand things, uh, you presented two uh, problems. The first one is about facility location, in, in other terms, and the second one is about vehicle routing. Uh, in my mind, both are MP hard, at least, right? Uh, but in your presentation, I, I just see uh, restricted mathematical models. So, uh, and in the second case, uh, I just see a genetic algorithm. So in my mind, both uh, have some problems, like for example, scalability, or uh, time, uh, the both are time consuming. So how can... No, no, the, so, so the, the first, the, the, for the facility location or the location problem, this was really extremely fast using CPREX with, with 30... So it was... It Did you benchmark it, for example? Did you compare it to the literature to... Because you said that you, you you have just twenty stations or something like that. So yeah. So in this, in the, I mean, in this problem, the the goal was not to have the fastest algorithm or whatever. This was really a decision making tool. In the other, in the vehicle routing algorithm, we benchmarked it and we we compared it to existing literature. We used state of the art methods. Mm -hmm. We compared to the best. Uh, methods existing so so there is no in the first one no this was not of interest yeah it, it, because it was we too we made an easy model it solved and it solved the problem we had so we didn't this was not the topic in this part so so the okay. topic in the first part was more the data analysis and how to have this chain so we first had to to determine these zones and then we had to and and so that the, the optimization algorithm was really not the research topic in the first uh, All right. part. So what about the genetic algorithm? So, uh, uh, yeah, so and in the second part, the genetic algorithm, this, this is clearly the state-of-the-art method for these kind of problems currently. Um, the, um, Thibault, who is the, the guy from now Rio, before he was in France and in the US, um, he has developed, uh, I would say, state-of-the-art method um, to solve all kinds of vehicle routing. He has developed a very generic framework. Um, <coughs> and, so, and so here I'm quite confident that this is absolute state of the art. And also we for this um, for precursor problem of this, which is the electric vehicle routing problem with time windows and complete recharge, we had a, a large neighborhood search and we also have a branch and price so we have also an exact method, um, and we compare them. So, so we are quite uh, confident about these these methods. Yeah. So, and and for this this first method, for this first thing, there is already a paper almost published. Uh, we are in the third revision now, um, and for the other um, works, we are currently in in writing these these things down. Thank you again. Uh, Thanks.